Hello everybody and welcome to a special video broadcast here from the Adafruit factory. We are picking and placing right now, that's what you're listening to in the background. But uh, you're not here for that, you're here because you want to hear from Michael Osmond, who is my special guest today. Thank you for coming by the Adafruit factory. Thank you for having me here. You are uh, a famous engineer, individual creator of amazing hardware gadgets, which is why people are watching. And uh, is it's true, true? I think yeah. people are watching because you're an amazing famous no, no. engineer. Well, no, because I'm here gadgets, all the time. You're the you're the you're the guest, <laughs> okay. uh, and you came here. And where where are you located? You're not in New Colorado. York. Colorado. So you no. you've been visiting here. Yeah. Came to New York. You said let's come by and do a video, and I said heck yeah, nice. Because you've been doing all this really cool stuff. So people are probably wondering what you keep talking about this cool stuff. What what is it? What kind of stuff do you do? And we'll get oh, to the details. Okay. Well, I like to make hardware tools. Mm -hmm open source hardware, of course, uh, for innovative folks. And so my, my background is from the information security community. And I got my start making hardware for tools for my own security research project. Okay. Initially, wireless communication security, yeah. uh, which is why a lot of folks know me from the software-defined radio world, it's because software-defined radio was such a, uh, an important tool in my background in wireless communication security research. But then I started making hardware tools and started making hardware tools for more and more things that That's what happens me. to engineers. Like you're, yeah. you're doing stuff and you're like, I need tools to do this stuff. And then now you're spending your time designing the tools to design the tools. Uh, I would suggest stopping before you start making a, a layout software, right? That's, <laughs> that's when you know you're in big trouble. So, you know, you, you were talking about information security for wireless. Was that like cracking Wi-Fi passwords? What, what does that mean? Uh, it's a lot of things, but uh, I kind of got my start in that area by looking at Wi-Fi security, mm -hmm. uh, but fairly quickly started trying to explore things other than Wi-Fi. And, and like, like car remote dongles? Exactly. There okay. you go. Uh, remote controls for, uh, for all kinds of things like uh, home automation systems, uh, remote controls for uh, uh, remote keyless entries of cars, yeah. garage door openers, alarm systems. There are a lot of industrial wireless, uh, like industrial control systems and industrial sensor networks. Um, and any more, most of the kind of uh, low speed digital wireless things are IoT devices. That's right. That's and, the hot new thing now, yeah. IoT. And so as these kinds of technologies have proliferated. Um, they do a really good job with security, right? No. Oh. No, they don't. Wow. Typically. That's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's not surprising at all. And, but, but as these have, pro have proliferated, people who need to study their security or want to study their security have needed new tools. Right. Like when the only digital wireless communication technology people used for the most part was Wi-Fi, we just needed tools for Wi-Fi. Right. But now we need tools for all sorts of different things. We need a tool for talking to your refrigerator or... Um, or your light bulbs, yeah. or, and Zigbee. There's like all sorts of like it's like the world is full of yeah these packets. They're flying by our heads right now. And those are just the standardized ones. Of course, most products that use some kind of digital wireless protocol don't even use the standardized protocol. They just create their own protocol for the for their sensor that's in the tire of your car yeah. or whatever. And and uh, it's not using Bluetooth. It's not using Wi-Fi. It's some something else. So you yeah. gotta figure out what that is. Yeah. Okay. So people who want to reverse engineer those or want to interface with those uh, need some kind of very flexible tool, and that's why software-defined radio is so important in this field of okay. security. Well, people are now their appetites are wedded, so let's show them some of the cool hardware that you've designed. I thought maybe we could start chronologically so you could sure. tell a story. Okay. So let's start with the good fit, which okay. actually you have as a, on the overhead. Yep. And so let's uh, show that off first. Here. This is not my design. But this was actually... By our neighbor, Travis Goodspeed. I'll that's just, right. I'm just going to lock the thing. Okay, yeah. Our neighbor, Travis Goodspeed, designed the GoodFet. And it was the first PCB that I... It was the first surface mount assembly that I ever did. Oh. It was a GoodFet that I soldered to do a project that Travis inspired me to do. And he handed me a PCB at a conference and said, here, this is what you need. Isn't he just a wonderful person? He is a He's wonderful like a, person. Okay, I, so you I think got of him as like the Johnny Appleseed of open source hardware in the, in the hacker community. Yeah. Because he just hands these things out, little planting seeds all over the place. It's true. And He's got uh, like a little sack. Okay, so you've yeah. got the mini B, and then this is like a uh, USB serial converter. Yep. And then what's this chip? That's an MSP430 microcontroller. Okay. 
And the reason he used an MSP430, I think, or initially, was because, uh, first of all, he was he was working with MSP430 targets that he was trying to uh, debug and program. Okay. And also, he based the original good FET on the MSP430 FET, which was a, uh, a debugger from Texas Instruments. What does FET stand for? FET stands for... <laughs> this is, okay, finally getting to one of my... <laughs> FET stands for Flash Emulation Tool. Uh, okay. Which good FET really is not... Uh, but it's related to the thing that is... It is, it right. cool, FET. It's, it's, it comes from a lineage of different uh, de uh, debuggers, some of which in the distant past like actually debugged CPUs by emulating Flash. We had actually this really cool project that uh, Scott T Tan Newt did, which is the emulating the Game Boy cartridge nice. flash. Yeah. So that is actually, we should call that uh, Game Fat. No, yes. Um, okay, so you, the Good Fit came out, and this is a couple years ago, and we actually uh, Yeah, like this. a decade ago. This is super cool. And then you decided, okay, we need something called the Great Fat. Yes. So let's look at this Great Fat, because we recently put this in the shop. Mm -hmm. And like this is, uh, you can see there's kind of a relation there. So. First off, the chip in the middle is an LPC 4330. Yeah. What is it? What's great about this chip? Why did you pick this beast? It's huge. It is huge. It is a, just a dramatically uh, more powerful uh, microcontroller than, say, the MSP430 that's that's on a good fit. Yeah. It's a ARM Cortex M4 with an ARM Cortex M0 coprocessor. Why do they do that? Processor. They toss two and what? I don't understand. How do you access both? Well, y you can actually run both at the same time, and they both, for the most part, have access to the same peripherals and memory space. Uh, so y you have to be kind of careful how you use that second core. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but you, you can do some really interesting things where, you, where like, if you can have like a real-time tight loop going in yeah. one of the cores, for example. Waiting for something, and it handles timers mm -hmm. or interrupts. I mean, you always need more timers. Right. It's always true. Right. And so if you want a really fancy timer, that's the, something you Cortex could... Cortex-M0 is, is yeah. a timer. Right. People were like, I just use a 555, terrified. Yeah. Okay, but so you got this chip. Yeah, and I, I found this chip the, the, when I was working on the HackRF project. This is the same microcontroller that's in HackRF. Ah, okay. And I got to like it for the HackRF project because of a whole bunch of nice features that it has. One of the main reasons I used it for HackRF originally was that it just is a nice, <laughs> low-cost way to get high-performance, high-speed USB. How fast is this running? Is this like a 100? It's a 200 megahertz. Wow. Uh, 204 megahertz. This arm. is fast. And we've been able to saturate USB buses, no problem. And this is doing uh, high-speed USB. This is one yeah. of the few chips that has high-speed USB. Again, I think Scott has, well, Rowan, I'm sure he talked to you about this, mm -hmm. is um, all of the chips that we've been using have been only um, full speed, right. which is 12 megabits, which is about one megabyte. Yep. When you deal with all the overhead, one megabyte of data uh, which per, uh, per second, which is not terribly fast. If you think about it, you're like, wow, a megabyte a second, but it's really it's one, 12 megabytes, it's one megabyte a second, one megabyte mm -hmm. a second. It's not that fast when you're doing video or audio. Right. Or when you're streaming a wireless data. Exactly. Right. And so with HackRF and GreatBet, we routinely stream at 40 megabytes per second. Right, which you need USB to have connection. this high speed, which was designed for video. So there's actually two USB ports on this. It does. What's up with that? Now that actually is related to uh, the GoodFet family. One of the variants of GoodFet that Travis Goodspeed designed that is quite popular in the information security community is called Face Dancer. Yeah. And it is a GoodFet that in addition to having the serial chip and the microcontroller, it has another chip on the other side which is a uh, USB device controller. Yeah and then a secondary USB port. So it looks like a good fit, except it has a USB port on either end. And not, you, not all chips have two USB ports. It's actually not that not uncommon, but it's not super common. Right. But you found one, this chip is super fast, and it has two USB ports, and both are high speed, or one is full? One is actually full speed. One full so high speed. So the secondary yeah. port is full speed, the primary port is high speed. Okay. Um, and it lets us actually, you, you and you can use either port in theory, in either host or device mode. Yeah. Um, and it, one of the things that lets us do is emulate another USB device, or actually emulate another USB host. And and so there's this uh, there's this concept that Face Dancer created, and and uh, we have continued on with Great Fat, which is that you can write a USB device in Python on your laptop. Mm. And 
it's a little bit hard is it like like, li- to wrap li- your head around. Is that like LibUSB-D? <laughs> it's, some, it's something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm actually a huge fan of LibUSB. Yeah. Guys, like oh, when yeah. we did the Connect hack, this was like now like eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we told people like, you know, you can just connect with LibUSB and, and get motor data and accelerometer data, but try to get the video data. Right. And uh, the person, uh, Mark M, who, mm-hmm. Mark M42, who's done a whole bunch of yep. cool USB stuff, uh, who eventually won the contest. I think they did, event- they, when they first released it, it was just a LibUSB driver in Python. Yeah. Worked fine now, and then you just displayed on the screen with- LibUSB and PyUSB in particular yeah. is, is super handy for, if you want to like reverse engineer a, a USB device. Mm-hmm. Uh, for that's a really good example where where like you just want to play with it so so all you need is a host computer to plug it into and an easy to manipulate Python or uh, uh, USB stack host stack so what we want to do with CrateFet is give people the easy to manipulate device stack well I can see other way around because let's yeah. say let's just say you want to like analyze the PlayStation 4 USB sure. host implementation you want to like send it weird stuff and you want to do that as part of a client, a lot of people don't realize normally with Pi USB, you can only act as the host talking mm-hmm. to a peripheral. And this would let you act as a peripheral talking to another host. Exactly. Which is very unusual, but when you need it, you need it, because otherwise there's yes. no way to connect a computer to a PS4. And a game controller or a game uh, console is yeah. a really good example of that, where like, it, oftentimes if you're reverse engineering something that's USB, well, maybe there, it's something that runs, that, like a USB device that, that plugs in and then there's some software on Windows. I'm like, well, okay, if you control the Windows box or you can run Windows in a VM on top of Linux, then you can sniff that USB, uh, all the USB communications yeah. very, very easily. But if there's a kind of host that you don't have control over, like a game console. Like an Xbox 360. Yes. With a Kinect or something. Then yeah. how do you, what tools do you use? Well, the answer and is a $1,200 Beagle, <laughs> but maybe you don't want to spend <laughs> or that Or a great fan. You can actually, the, the Face Dancer software, so Face Dancer originally uh, was a piece of hardware, which was uh, Travis Goodspeed's variant of GoodFet. Yeah. But today, when most people, when they talk about Face Dancer, they're actually talking about the software framework created by Kate Temkin, which is sort of like the new generation of face dancer. And she just did a talk, actually. She did. So let's yes. let's pop that stack. Uh, that stack. Let's pop that uh, card and stack. So Kate and Michaela, yep. uh, they were at Tear Down, and I have to watch this video because this she, Kate has just been doing amazing hacking with Switch and yep. uh, Nvidia Tegra, and just doing like even I'm kind of just like I don't understand this. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, um, we're, we're really lucky to have her. Yeah, this is so awesome. Uh, and. Uh, I love watching these videos because, again, it's like, I kind of like, well, I follow how you did it, but I don't know how you got there. And um, I think it's wonderful that we have hackers and people doing hacking. Um, you know, I, I, I love the beginners. I love their getting started and they're like, oh, I'm going to emulate a, a USB keyboard. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm so excited to see us really pushing the boundaries of the knowledge we have to uh, basically abuse Nintendo Switches. <laughs> um, it's like the forefront. <laughs> So she did this talk. Uh, this is my my interest uh, special there. So what uh, what was this talk about? And uh, you watched it. What was? Yeah, you were there. I, unfortunately, I was not able to be there in person. Okay. But I have seen the talk, and okay. uh, and I'm very uh, much involved with the the work that's gone into the talk. Um, and I'm super excited about it because uh, Kate and Michaela were working on sort of uh, some really low cost like hardware hacks basically to capture and do analysis of USB. Um, so like doing doing analysis of full speed USB for example f- with like less than ten dollar platform. Yeah. Um, and that was that was exciting on its own. But then like in the few days leading up to this talk at Teardown, uh, they just like went on a tear and and developed an entire new software uh, Analyzer, yeah, which is fantastic. Like I, what's it I, called? Wait. It's called ViewSB. ViewSB, okay. ViewSB. And then, sorry, there's another thing that White Quark is working on. Do you know yes. What is that? The Glasgow. Glasgow. Uh, and yeah. I'm not an expert on that, but it's an exciting project that is kind of uh, related. It's also a Python USB. I think it's a little different, coming from a different angle. It, it's an FPGA based. Um, I think the the phrase I heard. Yeah used to describe it recently was Digital Interface Explorer, which yeah. I really like a lot. Yeah. Uh, and that's an exciting project. And and in fact, I, there was a really cool thing. Um, somebody made a neighbor for GreatBet recently that 
and, and like posted a long thread on Twitter. Uh, this was Mike Walters in, in Scotland, and and he he w- he wanted to stream um, he wanted to stream video data out of a an old uh, thermal imaging camera that yeah. only did stills, and he yeah. was like, I want to hack it to stream video, mm-hmm. and he m- basically used a great bet to do that. Um, but as like part t- of his taking, debugging process, taking he used to Glasgow because yeah. it, like having both tools in his toolbox was really useful. For so you can project. take stills with my controller Cortex M4 code, but then he pushes that into a USB uh, video uh, like uh, structure. Or I don't know a whole lot about his solution know. to be honest. Other I than look this up. other than that, he has some. <laughs> he does. He does. Ha- Get get some captures, okay. uh, and he's like taking advantage of the high speed USB yeah. interface. And no, for video, video you have to. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so Kate's using so her talk is about it, and so the software that she wrote View USB uh-huh. that runs on the Great Fed. It's the interface code to a Great Fed. It's actually just a uh, USB runs in Python on your host okay. computer, and it can use a variety of different sources for uh, USB capture. Okay. One of those can be a Great Fed. Uh, one of those could be. Um, a uh, uh, just like a the USB mon uh, yeah. interface in the yeah. Linux kernel, um, and so she's created kind of a, a framework that that can have different pluggable backend capture modules and different pluggable front end visualization modules, and it just makes USB a whole lot easier to understand in my opinion. All right, so people who are doing USB analysis, check out uh, Kate Temkin's talk. It just went live at Teardown. So one of the one of the things that she she did in that talk was was something uh, a feature. She took advantage of a feature of Great Fet and Face Dancer that she and Dominic Spill had developed like a year before, which is that you can take a, a Great Fet and plug it into your laptop, and then that pair of devices can be a USB proxy. Mm-hmm. And so then you can plug in, say, a game controller from your yeah. console into the laptop and you could plug in the great bit into your game console. Yeah. And it look it looks kind of ridiculous as a long chain of I devices. Know, but but, <laughs> but well, then what you're doing is you're proxying the USB communication between the two the device and the host, neither of which you you control. Yeah. And you can sniff all that traffic and you even modify it in transit. It. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it sounds that sounds like a fun time. And yeah. and definitely that's the I mean, USB is, is on one hand, it's structured, so it's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least, you know, you're not, with wireless, it is a little bit tougher because you don't even know what the structure is. With USB, so far, seems people seem to stick to like, okay, we're using control for control, interrupt, but you know, the, the packets on the interrupt are usually interrupt, bulk is usually bulk. Um, so that's that's good. So let's uh, get back to um, this great fed. And, and so you've got these friends. Yes. All right, so this friend, this na- sorry, this neighbor. 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 We call our friends neighbors. Our friends neighbors. So this is a neighbor <laughs> that Gladolius. And so here's the first thing I am struggling with. Okay. There's so many pins, and I, I don't want to remo- I don't want to remove this and maybe bend some of the pins. What do I do? You use a wiggler. What? What is a wiggler? <laughs> <laughs> a wiggler is this little uh, lever. Okay. That we use, uh, Genius. Is this to, patented? Because it should wiggle. be. <laughs> no. It, well, I actually got okay. this idea. Do you mind just bring up a little bit? Because yeah, you yeah. can see it on the overhead. Uh, you can see. I got this idea oh. from Colin O'Flynn. Oh, look at uh, that. So you just kind of lever each corner off. And you, you can't really do it all at once. You have to kind of like no, that's fine. wiggle one, well, one you can corner stack and then neighbors. another. You can stack neighbors. Okay, so each neighbor, these are like, you know, Arduino has shields and, uh-huh. and Raspberry Pi has hats. What, yeah. what are these neighbors? So neighbors are add-on boards for Great Fet, and they do a variety of different things. But we don't uh, we don't have any of them actually shipping yet. There, but we have a whole bunch of different prototypes. Okay, so what's uh, this one? Gladiolus. So this one, Gladiolus is Gladiolus. A, is a, and everything in the Great Fet project, all the hardware designs are named after flowers. So Great Fet one is actually also known as Azalea, um, and we've just gone alphabetically. And I think we're up to like S or T at this point. Okay. But uh, Gladiolus is a um, a neighbor for doing software-defined infrared. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's like taking a software-defined radio approach to infrared hacking. Okay. We have uh, we're sem- we're sampling like 10 megahertz of bandwidth from a photodiode. Yep. And then we're also able to transmit about 10 megahertz of bandwidth uh, on the on the transmit side. Actually, this is an older prototype. I just realized that is totally missing the transmit path. Except we can like twiddle the uh, LED with a 
with yeah. a GPIO yeah, yeah, pin. And that was like, oh, that was the, good enough for the first round. And this is the receive right. path. The and receive path is pretty probably like, fully why, populated. Why is there so much stuff? It actually turns out that infrared receive is way more complicated <laughs> than you think. You think like, oh, you're just, you just like connect it up to a JFET, you're done. No. <laughs> No. no, it's actually <laughs> those little chips, those little like five dollar black three pin. Yeah, are kind of wonkers. They're pretty good. Um, however, and those are fantastic tools for the job. But they're, they're but they're tools for a particular job, which is picking up like on off key data at thirty eight carrier carrier That's around thirty eight kilohertz. Exactly. So they can't do more. They can't do less. Right. And they sometimes they don't even like different. They don't they don't like anything but fifty percent pulse right. uh, data. Uh, so if you want to. Uh, if you want to explore the infrared inter and a more oddball infrared interface, yeah. like the audio interface that's in a lot of vehicle uh, seatback entertainment systems, yeah. uh, or the uh, or the the face detection uh, infrared sensor that's on cell phones. Yeah. Um, and all kinds of other weird infrared things that are not 38 kilohertz remote control. You know what? Control. you got to get your old Palm Pilot 3 yeah. with the IR. <laughs> IRDA. The IRDA. That, I remember like IRDA was going to be like, that was it. I actually we tried. figured this out. I tried to do an IRDA demo with Gladiolus, like when I first made Gladiolus. Yeah. And it Being was so busy. hard just getting anything <laughs> IRDA to work at all in like 2018. This I was know. this was not. I easy. know, but they were like, they, remember there was like the demo was like you're totally gonna be your business card, but then they had like yeah. two people with a pop out, and they had to be like so close. Yeah. You're like, look, just have a cable. <laughs> uh, okay, so you got you got the IRDA um, neighbor. Let's look at yeah. some other neighbors you have. Sure. Well, this is a neighbor that's super simple. Uh, that's exactly Daffodil. what you think. It's just a prototyping neighbor. It's just a convenience, I love so you little. can have a little uh, solderless breadboard that you tack on there. Very handy. Oh, and this is a total like last week prototype. But Taylor, I will warn people. You know, those breadboards are only good up to 10 megahertz. Don't try to put signals higher than that in them. That's yeah, that is generally the limit. true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is just a little neighbor pin protector. Oh that, yeah. That we're just experimenting with. This, so this is this, actually like the very first try. So I just want to see it. So, so it goes, just, it just, just snaps in. Snap on there. How lovely. And uh, hopefully that means I can keep it in my bag. And well, I mean, so far so good. So I far, took it to yeah, New York and they're okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So and you got here's Bethel. another neighbor called Quince, which Wait is. Wait a sort minute! Of, you just jumped to Q. Oh yeah. Oh, I do have a Q. Yeah. But you said it was alphabetical. I know, but I didn't bring them all with me. Oh, These did you have that many prototypes? Yeah. Uh, yeah wow. Actually. Okay. So what's what's E? Uh, e. I'm e trying to. Oh, E is Adelice, and that one actually has not made it to layout yet. Okay. And I don't know if it ever will. Okay. Well, you said you said to ask you about <laughs> ones that are not released yet. <laughs> Well, all of, none of these are released yet. That's true. But the ones that will be out soon, actually, are going to be uh, Daffodil, Daffodil and Gladiolus. These are handy. Those are kind of like the, the, the two that are ready to go to, the, to production right Classic. now. And the other one that I don't have with me, but we're really excited about that will be out fairly soon, is Foxglove, which is, uh, I call it an advanced level shifting neighbor. Okay. Um, so, uh, Great Fed does 3.3 volt I.O. Yeah. And it has all these wonderful peripherals, but it only does 3.3 volt I/O. So we wanted to have a level shifter that has some advanced capabilities for like pin remapping through an FPGA mm, and okay. probing of things. And like, if you want to just temporarily hook up an ADC to one of these signals and see what's going on yeah. and, and do that all from software. Oh, so a little expander. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. Okay, and then you've got so this this Kints. What's yeah. which one is this? This this is actually like a, memory. a very early uh, uh, prototype of uh, this is my new software defined radio. Um, oh man, which, I love how simple you're keeping it. <laughs> In theory, you're done right. <laughs> so so actually, this, this is a software. This is an LM386. What's going on? It is a here? comparator. So you're, it's, you're a close. Three, it's a 393. You're close. Uh, it's a it's a dual comparator. Okay. I'm doing quadrature sampling. Um, and uh, with with basically a, a comparator as a one bit ADC, That's if you fine. if you sample fast enough, then you can decimate in software and gain dynamic range. And so, like the 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 logical conclusion of that is to make the fastest one bit ADCs we can and do radio that way. Okay. Uh, and Quince actually uh, is a prototype that. Uh, someday we'll have a little bit of an RF section on it. Yeah. And we're experimenting with all channel Bluetooth monitoring with it, like sampling all 79 Bluetooth channels simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. This uh, is definitely something people cost. people ask about Bluetooth low energy. They're like, you can, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't get the right channel, there's two channels, they're like, I, I dropped this, you have to kind of try over and over again. Right. Okay, so these are some, and then what was the one that I had to ask you about? 
the one that Kate used. Sorry. Oh yeah, rhododendron. 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 Oh, uh, Kate just talked about uh, at, uh, at in her talk at Tear, at Teardown last week. Yeah. And that is a USB analysis neighbor. And so uh, that one I don't have with me uh, because it doesn't, it. it doesn't even really exist yet except as like a mess of wires on Kate's desk. Yeah. But it's really simple. It's a ULPI, which is the Phi chip for high-speed USB, um, that, is, that is passively tapping a, 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 a USB signal. So just got that goes, in and out. It just has two USB that connectors and, then, and then a ULPI in the middle. Yep. And that's and basically it. it. Okay. And so it's like the lowest cost high-speed USB like pass-through analyzer yeah. that we can devise. Sounds good. It's right, working and it is working pretty well so far. And and so so as people are watching they're like, "Wow, I could really, you know, this is cool. You have this incredibly powerful 204 megahertz mm -hmm. Cortex M4 um, and I want to design my own neighbors." Yeah. So what's the licensing cost? What how much do they have to pay you? to design their own neighbors. Uh, so at Grace Scott Gadgets, we do nothing but open source. What? We make open source hardware, and all of our software is open source, and all of our you content mean it's is all, open. It's all on this GitHub? Yes. Right here? <laughs> it is. Wow, look, Foxglove, <laughs> Jasmine. So if there's Lucky Bamboo. Oh, well, you've got the ADF7242, so you could do like oh, yeah. SDR stuff with that one. Not the uh, DMR. Um, yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah. These that, are, that's these actually are cool. the uh, the 2.4 gigahertz version of the one that can do DMR, Oh, sorry. I it's but, I, all I remember is the ADS72 because I was like, I remember yeah, that yeah. chip. They have one in the family that's a sub gigahertz part. They uh, Yes, this is awesome. And then, you know, people can do, uh, you know, what would be really neat is uh, when you do sub gigahertz, people can do their own, uh, you know, LoRa yep. style implementation. I mean, not LoRa, of course, but like uh, FSK. That is some, something I'm very interested in. Definitely. I mean, everyone's interested in it because, yeah. of course, it's like, you can't use it, but uh, send patent. But it would be interesting <laughs> to come up with something similar, maybe. Uh, um, yes. And there's people who are doing similar, not LoRa, but similar uh -huh. wide range um, wireless. Maybe, yeah. maybe even you. Uh, okay, so people <laughs> can go here, and these are in KiCad. What are they? What are they in? Yes, uh, most of our designs are in KiCad, and uh, occasionally we've been dabbling a bit with uh, with Skittle, um, which is a, uh, <laughs> a Python uh, a, a way to create your schematics in Python. Okay. Uh, so you code your schematic instead of drawing it. Um, but we, we, but pretty much everything's in uh, Inky Cat. Yeah, and the people can design the 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 pinouts are available, and then yep. they'll still have to write the host driver like plugin. So they would do that, and uh, this is in um, like I'm assuming this is ARM GCC. What's so the tool our, chain for this? Our firmware is in ARM GCC, uh, and I think our firmware is pretty easy to work with. However, for most people who use Great Bets, I don't env envision that they ever touch the firmware, and and this is something that uh, we've sort of taken from the tradition of GoodFet. GoodFet gave people an easy-to-use Python interface yeah, to interface with your outside world. Okay. And we've kind of taken that to the next level. And we have a very extensive uh, Python host-based framework. So when you plug in your GreatBet, all you have to do is install our Python library. And you can start like turning on or off it. LEDs, yeah. triggering GPIO things, and just like one or two lines of Python. So can you say like, okay, I want it, is there like a high level command for like, oh, grab me uh, 8, 80 megahertz sample data from these two pins and return them as a buffer? We like don't have how, that how do you... abstracted super well yet, yeah. um, but commands we have abstracted okay. very well. Uh, the streaming, uh, we do have some abstraction, or, or at least some sample code you can copy pretty easily. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I, t I take that back. Kate has created an awesome, uh, <laughs> she's so great. She's created an awesome driver, actually, recently, for this interesting peripheral on the LPC4330 that is called SGPIO, Serial GPIO. Yeah. And it's like this streaming engine um, that let, like runs separate from the CPUs. Uh, so in addition to those two cores, you also get this SGPIO peripheral that can like stream data in and out on uh, like up to 16 pins. Yeah. And we do now have a kind of a general purpose driver for using that. And so like the, the initial thing that we anticipate people using that for a lot is logic analysis. Using GreatBet as a logic analyzer and dumping yeah. all everything into SIGROC, for example, is super easy. Is there a SIGROC driver for the GreatBet, or is that coming soon? That's coming soon. Okay. Uh, we have we have already in the GreatBet code the ability to export files that from our logic analyzer uh, function that SIGROC 
can you? Yeah. Uh, but Kate actually has a uh, driver for Sig Rock, like in her Sig Rock four car yeah. GitHub she's already. Like, she's like working on it. Uh, it's, check it out. I'm sure she's it's like. It's not getting, pushed upstream yet, but yes. it does exist. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. So I want to. So we talked a lot about the great fit, but I, you know, you have some key points. And I want to make sure that we got into a lot of detail. But the key points are, with this, you don't have to write firmware for the mm. LPC chip. You're writing all the code in a higher level language, Python, right. which then gets run, you know, which is easy to write, and you don't have to worry about compiling and, and injecting the code on. You just write it and run it. Um, it's a multi-tool. It can do high-speed GPIO. Does it have ADCs on it or other peripherals? It does. Okay. Uh, the, the ADC that's built in the no, microcontroller right. is like not great, but yeah. it's, it's useful. Um, but so for things, have a oscilloscope, but for you things can do like for Gladiolus, we put on our own, high, yeah. you know, 20 mega sample ABC. But you can do SPI high speed, you can do GPIO high speed, mm -hmm. you can get data to and from it as USB peripheral or host, you can do high speed USB, um, and it's basically kind of like a, a it's kind of the opposite of a logic analyzer, it's a logic injector, right? It's, yeah. It can be a logic analyzer. We think of it as like a bi-directional logic analyzer. Yeah. It lets us do a logic analysis and then also twiddle things at the same time. I kind of think of this as like, there's the um, the Bus Pirate, which is also yes. open source software, which is awesome. Yes. And it's kind of a, it's a uh, REPL scripted, although you can script it from, you know, Python mm -hmm. as well. And it's much lower speed, but it's designed for like, okay, you can do a quick I squared C scan and, and push and pull data from SPI. Right. That's a little bit higher level and not as fast. This is a lower level, but much more broad in its capabilities. Yeah, I think it, it would not, be a bad description to just call Great Fed a super bus pirate. Like a super, like, super mega bus pirate. Yeah, and also I know yeah. people do FT232H, they use that chip and it's high speed, but it's very weird and finicky. Like you can't use I squared C and your at the same time. Mm -hmm. Annoying. Um, so Great Fed is just, just came out. Yep. It's available at the Adafruit shop, so you can pick one up and it supports you. If, I'm sure you also, there's a, is there a shop for uh, Great Scott Gadgets that can go to get not directly. Not directly. So, no. but we're just everything you guys make. Well, I don't carry it. Uh, and then you also have the um, we'll, we'll carry these neighbors when they're also available. And then I also want to show um, special um, uh, sneak preview or sneak post view of this porta pack. So we want to talk about. <laughs> This you brought cool. this. Yeah, this, it just this, happened, not... this happened to fall out of my bag as we were sitting down at the table. And so I was like, oh, this? you have to see this. And then you have the hack RF one which you've carried for a while. Yeah. What the, how does that relate to this? We'll go to so that. So this, what you're seeing here, is the port pack for hack RF one that's made by Jared Boone of ShareBrand Technology. And Do you want a USB to plug it in? Um, is that a bad idea to know antenna? We, we could. I don't even know if I have... What? What? Let's see. I don't even know if I have uh, uh, the right firmware on here. Okay. Or if it's, so really no, I think I was testing uh, regular HackRF firmware okay. on here on it, so it doesn't actually have the. Uh, but pretend there's a beautiful. Pretend display. there's a beautiful display. The, it does uh, like 18 megahertz wide waterfall plots. Yeah. It has a, an SD card slot for capturing and replaying waveforms. Yeah. It has an audio in and out, so it has an audio codec uh, with like a four pin uh, in and out. Um, so you can like listen to FM, we can decode FM. Yeah. So so this is not just for most people think about SDR. This is an SDR device. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know about these low-cost uh, SDRs that you plug into your computer. They're meant for watching like digital TV, but you can like listen to radio, which is like super cool. Mm -hmm. um, this is the RTL SDR. Right. So this is kind of again, it's the super mega version of that. Yeah, I would think a super RTL SDR is exactly what HackRF is. Yeah. Uh, like the big differences between RTL SDR and HackRF are uh, that HackRF can transmit as well as receive. Yeah. HackRF has a much wider operating frequency range. Uh, so there are a lot of technologies like, say, Bluetooth in the 2.4 gigahertz band that are just out of range for an RTL yeah. SDR. We'll see, if you are using the transmit, uh, be aware that uh, you're not always allowed to transmit on every frequency. Yeah. Uh, this is definitely more cutting edge than, than USB. I have, I actually got my uh, license specifically so I uh -huh. could like do this stuff and be like, look, I have a license. I can do this stuff. That's but, a good uh, move. Just uh, letting people know, they're going to ask, like, hey, is that legit? Maybe. Uh, but we're, we're hackers here. So um, the HackRF1, let's show one off. Do you want to grab sure. it? We can, uh, we can show, this, here, show this somewhere. fast. And uh, so this is the board that is actually under, I don't have a thing to open it. Oh. I have, here, I have user, circuit user, boards. User um, so this is the HackRF1. And it comes wrapped in plastic, so it's useful for like, um, you know, 
throwing it into your laptop bag. Okay, so and you've got LED indicators and then antenna. Antenna, clock, clock in, in and out, out, which not very many people use, but is useful for experimentation when you need to have tightly synchronized, uh, multiple radios tightly synchronized. Yeah. If you want to experiment with like phased array uh, radar or yeah. something like that. I mean, it's there. You're like, here's the output. You yeah. Is and this, a USB is, port. So, so this antenna can do receive and transmit. That's right. On what frequency ranges? From one megahertz to six gigahertz. So that's pretty high. So yeah. you can do Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, a little, you know, not sub gigahertz, but no, it's using yes. one megahertz. One megahertz. Oh, so you can do very low very frequency. Very low frequency. So you, if you are uh, a ham radio licensed person, you can use this to do ham radio listening as well as transmitting. Yeah. All digitally. Right. And then how do you program this? Uh, and so this is actually, if you. <laughs> If you look at the circuit board inside here, like half of it is basically a great fit. Yeah. So like, it it is what's the, the, what's the, the digital. What's the chip you use? It's to the up the for, sorry. No, the uh, digi the uh, RF. The question. The uh, RF side. Yeah, RF side. It's actually multiple chips. Okay. It's it's like pieced together from various technologies. And one does two gigahertz. One does oh, one. It's a uh, it's a dual conversion architecture. Okay. Radio. Uh, this kind of the central piece of the radio. It, it is a really a WiMAX chip. Okay. Um, but we do basically dual conversion with a high intermediate frequency in a two gigahertz band, and that's what the, uh, the Wi-Fi chip handles. Got it. Um, and so this is the board that's underneath the the porta pack here. If you look at like the ends of the porta pack, you see the the same connectors. Yeah. Uh, that are that are on. But uh, you, you just took the top off and put the TFT exactly. and display on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you've done the hacker off. So, so this one is this is kind of. The great fit, but for RF, yes. same thing. Except of course you can't go in between RF, but you can listen, retransmit, um, and then when uh, to program it, you use Python also, or how do you? What's the? You can, um, but for the most part, what HackerF gives you is just a streaming interface. Yeah. Um, yeah you're yeah. raw. You're you're, you're, you're just on you're just own. either pushing raw samples for it to transmit over the antenna or you're pulling raw samples that it's receiving on its antenna. Think of it as like an antenna to USB adapter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's like... It's a wire. But it's a little bit of circuitry between the wire. Like, uh, it does have some other special functions. Like we have a sweep feature in okay. software so you can do uh, like wideband spectrum analysis where where the firmware is doing the sweeping for you really fast. Can you do, do, can you do an, like antenna testing with it? Yeah, you could. However, not, not very well because it's half duplex. Uh, okay. It's only transmitting or receiving one at a time, not both at the same time. And so, to do proper antenna analysis, you need you something that can yeah. do both at the same time. Um, so you can kind of hack something together with maybe two hacker apps really? to in test antennas nice well. But. Okay, so you've got you've got the Great Fat. You've got yeah. the hacker F one. What's next? What's next? Lots of things for Great Fat. You get uh, very excited about the Great Fat Neighbors. We're very excited about Great Fat Neighbors. All the all the projects that ask, we're working is on right now. Neighbor? Well, there may be, uh, there there probably will be one or more neighbors for Great Fat that do software defined radio. Some parts of this in some way. Yeah. They're probably. I don't. I don't anticipate that we would like replace Hack RF okay. with a Great Fat Neighbor. Okay. But more special, at least for now, more special purpose or lower cost SDR solutions we're experimenting with to build on top of Great Fat. Excellent. All right. So people want to join in this party. First off, they can pick up the Great Fat from us or other people who vend the Great Scott Gadgets. Also, we have the Hack RF that we stock. And then check out the GitHub that we uh, posted up. It's a great fit dash hardware. Check out these neighbors and we want to see what other people in the community, I'm sure everyone watching is like, I have my own interface, my own protocol, my thing I want to use this high speed analyzer on. I'm sure that you, you'd love to see others and maybe we'll post them up on the blog. Uh, this would be cool, like a, like a rainbow of neighbors. I hope so. So far we've only really seen kind of one significant neighbor from outside of Grey Scott Gadgets, and that was that one I mentioned from Mike Walters where he was hacking his thermal camera. But it's really cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but you know what? When they need it, they need it. You know what yeah. I mean? You'll know, because I think people do make Arduino shields, do this sort of thing, or, or BeagleBone, I know, has audio um, you know, add-ons, uh, because BeagleBone also has this kind of interesting high-speed mm -hmm. interface ability. Right. Uh, that might be a good um, option for the Grey Fit. Well, we've been here for a bit, and I think we, uh, we covered everything. On your list. All right. <laughs> right? Is I think on so. Your list? I don't think so. Yeah.
And that's why it's called great fat. It's next, next step yeah. for good fat, right? I think, you know, if okay. there's one kind of final thought I'd like to get yeah, people, it, it's that you don't have to write firmware. Uh, don't be like us. <laughs> you, you can write firmware. And actually, so one of the things I really like uh, about your work is how much, how easy you've made it for people to write firmware. And like, CircuitPython is a really good example of like yeah. making it super, super easy to write firmware. We're taking with GreatFed a little bit of a different approach, which is don't even write firmware at all. Use a use this device as a peripheral, yeah. not as an embedded device. Yeah. So we're giving people a peripheral development model instead of an embedded development model, which we feel is better for like rapid prototyping. Which is what you do when you're doing security research. You it is. You have to try yes. a billion things. Yeah. And maybe maybe the things you learn once you've played with it as a peripheral, uh, with whatever your project is, once you've played with your project as a peripheral, maybe those things you've learned will help you then be able to more effectively do something embedded. Uh, but when you're first exploring some new you interface... You spend like six hours on a tool chain and then be like, okay, right. I'm, I'm completely burnt out and <laughs> you know, I just figure out how to like... SWD to it and upload something and like now I have to start that sucks. Yeah. I mean we've done it and we'll do it But it's it's to get people going faster Also, what's nice is you know people be able to if you have two people with the same hardware You can then have people try the same experiments. Okay, you have this Nintendo switch I have one let's both try the script. Mm -hmm. What do you get when you try it against your firmware version? Mm -hmm. I think that's easier to do than like okay. Here's here's a C file <laughs> install docker <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it means better than other things, but still, I think this will, you know, pass me on a Python script uh, that runs on this kind of hardware. will make that a lot easier. So, neighbors working together. Yes. For great justice. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Michael Austin, for being here. This was an amazing video. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Is it, you, you have one question. No, I'm good. Good. Uh, thank you for coming by. This was jam-packed with info. Um, I want to get everybody to go to Great Scott's Gadgets website and check out the amazing open source hardware that's coming out of this team. Uh, it's revolutionary and it's definitely made information security and reverse engineering so much easier. Uh, so thank this great neighbor by supporting his and his uh, friends' hardware by purchasing some. That's all, folks. Bye.